Okay, so um, thank you for uh, for being here and attending the talk on one attack and three um, three possible three possible defenses. My name is Martin uh, Martin Hoppe, and I will um, take you on a journey uh, uh, on how to improve the security of web of your web applications. Um, to how to protect it from from one of the many threats that um, that we have. Before we begin, um, I have a question for you. Do you know who this guy is? If anybody knows, raise your hand. Okay. Um, so it turns out that this guy is um, is a British knight. Uh, so if you met him in a pub, you would have to title him Sir. Uh, and his name is uh, Sir Tim Berners-Lee. Um, and this guy is uh, more widely known as the inventor, inventor of the web. Um, so, so this is a guy who uh, worked at a Swiss research institute called CERN. Um, and as, as part of his, his job, was uh, <coughs> he, um, he wrote the first or created the first the first website um, on earth it's it's still accessible uh, on this URL uh, it's very instructive to try to go there maybe not now maybe later um, because one of the one of the things that uh, are featured on this website is a uh, is an emulator of the first of the first web browser so if you go there you have a chance to um, to see how the web worked when it first uh, when it was first invented. And as the web was invented then, it was um, comprised mainly of the HTTP protocol and the HTML markup language. So, so what you could do with, uh, with all of those technologies, you could browse, your, you could browse web pages and hope, hop from one page, uh, from one page to another. And the protocol as it was invented was completely completely stateless. So uh, every request that arrived at the server was completely independent from, uh, from, from, all the other, uh, from all the other requests. So if you were a user and uh, you were hopping from one page to, uh, to another, um, there was no such thing originally as the as a user session, so uh, things like the Amazon shopping basket or signing in to, web to a website was uh, was completely completely unknown. And do you know uh, what's the name of the mechanism that that solves this problem? So, <clears throat> so the mechanism that uh, allows us to add the session state. To, uh, to web applications are known as cookies. And these cookies are, um, are formally specified as, as an addition to the HTTP uh, protocol in a, what is a surprisingly readable, readable RFC. So cookies, what they allow you to do is they, they can add, they allow you to implement sessions and authentication in, um, in your in your web application. So how it works is that um, when you make a request to, to an HTTP server, um, in, in one of the headers, the server returns uh, a piece of data that the browser will uh, will include in every subsequent um, subsequent web request to that domain. Uh, and it, we will uh, we will see an example of that in uh, in just a couple of seconds. Uh, those pieces of information are completely application specific. So um, you can pass a session identifier there. Uh, you can pass uh, an authentication token or any other type of information that that you wish to be uh, that you wish that that the session uh, preserves. Uh, okay and. If you um, if you use cookies to convey authentication information, uh, the the thing that you actually uh, have created is called an ambient authority. So the browser that possesses the um, the authentication cookie um, is whenever a request it makes, it's always always authenticated, whether the user realizes this or not. And this is um, an extremely powerful concept uh, that can be 
that can be abused. So this is um, a policeman, a deputy, uh, and he holds a gun. So if an attacker wants to use that gun, they have basically two ways of doing that. One of them is stealing the gun, but they can also trick or confuse the deputy uh, to use the gun in attacker's, in attacker's favor. And that concept in computer security is known as the confused deputy problem, where uh, a privileged entity is, is tricked into doing actions uh, of, of attackers, attackers li liking. And here, the, the gun, the loaded gun that, uh, that we have is the authenticated, authenticated web browser. Um, and in, in the domain of, of, of web applications, the, the actual incarnation of this problem is, is known as cross-site cross request, request forgery. So you can see uh, it's abbreviated CSRF or uh, CSRF. That's, that's one of the pronunciations that you may run into. And you, you can see that there are, there are like two components to this, to this problem. There's a cross-site aspect to it, so there, there, uh, there must be at least two sites to carry on the attack, and there's the forgery element. So let's see, let's see how that works. So we have a, a victim uh, of an attack, and we have a legit, legit website that they are using. So the first step to carry on the attack is for the victim to, oh, sorry. Um, the, the setup for the attack is that the attacker sets up a bogus site. This is the, the cross element of the cross-site request forgery. And what they put on this website is a simple HTML form that when submitted, submits an HTTP request to the legit site. It doesn't look particularly dangerous just yet, but Let's wait a second. The next step is that the user or our victim logs into the website. So what they now have is an authenticated session with, uh, with the website, and their browser, their browser is actually the loaded gun because it possesses the authentication cookie. So the next step of the attack is that uh, the attacker sends them a forged link to the bogus site. This is the element, this is, this is the moment where uh, various phishing tricks uh, or a little bit of social engineering has to, be, uh, has to be employed to have the victim click that link. When the victim clicks the link, um, the, the, their browser downloads this forced form, right? And this is actually the moment where the user has the loaded gun uh, in their hands and are ready to fire. So if they click the link, uh, go to the website and uh, submit it, what happens is that they are making the, an authenticated request because they possess the cookie and the browser will attach the cookie to every request. Um, but what the, the thing they are actually submitting is the HTML form that's, that's planted, planted by the attacker. Uh, and how serious that problem is? Um, it turns out that this problem is, is fairly serious. Um, on the OWASP top 10 list of the most, uh, most uh, serious problems of, of web applications, this one landed number eight on the list. So I would say it's, it's pretty prevalent and, um, and pretty important. So it's time for a very quick demo to just show you how that works, how that works in practice. So what I, what I have in here is a, our legit application is, um, is something that I put together really quickly to just show you um, the, the, the underlying concept. So we have a very simple web application that allows you to do two things. Uh, one of them is login. Uh, the logins are conveniently provided, uh, provided here, and the password is, is obviously a well-protected secret. So I'll just I'll just go uh, log in as one of the one of the users, and when I log in, I have access to the profile page, which allows me to update the some profile some profile information. Okay, okay, it's um, it's persisted somewhere, and here I have my bogus page. 
Uh, up until very recently, that referred to previous iPhone versions, but I learned that the iPhone X is, uh, is now a thing. So if you see such a page, this is a, a prototypical uh, phishing uh, page that uses very simple uh, social engineering to trick you into clicking a button. So I clicked a button, um, and all I get is uh, just a little thank you message from the contest organizers. Um, as you can probably imagine, I will never hear from these people again. But if I go to my website and go to the profile, you can see that this information here has been altered. How did that happen? Um, so if I show you uh, how the uh, how my evil site looks like in HTML, uh, what you can see here is that I have a button, this button, win an iPhone, um, and when I click that button, a function in JavaScript is called, that's called submit the evil form. And that function, what it does is it submits something called the evil form um, and shows up the, the pop-up that, that I just showed you. And the form here, as you can, as you can see, um, is something that makes a request to our legit site. The only thing that it does, however, is to set the bank account value to something of, of attacker's choosing. Um, in order to hide the fact that uh, a form has been submitted, we, uh, the target of this is an evil iframe, and that evil iframe is hidden. So the form has been submitted, and actually the browser received the server-side uh, response from the legit site. It's, it's just that this has been, uh, has been hidden very well. So this is um, how the attack, uh, how the attack is, uh, is carried out uh, in real life. Uh, it's, it's, surprisingly, uh, it's surprisingly prevalent in, uh, in web applications, primarily because we, we, we often associate uh, security bugs with uh, making coding errors. And this, unfortunately, is not the case here. We've done nothing wrong. This is just how the web works. Um, so how to protect ourselves against uh, this kind of threat? Um, so the one, one idea of uh, protecting yourself is to start where the problem really, uh, really begins, that is with, with the browser. And the, mechanism, uh, and the mechanism to do that is called the same site cookies. So cookies can have multiple attributes that control their, uh, their behavior by the browser. Um, and um, they have stuff like domain, whether they are visible to JavaScript and, and all, those sorts of, all those sorts of things. Uh, but we're, what we're primarily interested in here is uh, controlling to which websites the cookie will be. Um, cookie will be submitted. And here, if you attach a same side attribute to your cookies, uh, what it's going to do is that it will attach the cookie only if you submit a form that comes from the same, uh, from the same website. Uh, and we, I will show you how that works in, in just a couple of seconds. Uh, the same side cookie, which is what's, what's quite important, comes in two flavors, lax and strict. Uh, the strict version applies the behavior anytime, uh, and that's, that's usually what you, what you would want. Uh, but there are cases like you, where you want to pre preserve, uh, preserve the cookie even though you come from a, from a different site. Uh, like, for example, you have a link from Facebook or um, any other benign or trusted site, and you still want the authentication cookie to be transmitted. That's where you, uh, where you can use lax, and it will apply only to web requests with verbs that should not change the service state, which is get, uh, had, the trace options, and, uh, and so on. At the moment, oh, sorry. Uh, at the moment, it's just an RFC draft, so it's not a specification that has been uh, fully, uh, fully ratified, uh, but but it's there. So if you if we get back to uh, our crime scene, you can see that the the arrow from the victim victim's laptop to the legit users um, and the, the legit site uh, is now black. This means that there's uh, there's no authentication cookie transmitted, so the 
the request will go through, but it will be a completely unauthenticated uh, request. Okay, so uh, let's see how that works in, in practice. And here I have a I have a shout out to this uh, this application here is uh, is an ASP.NET Core application, um, and here's my shout out to the ASP.NET security team. You spoil my demo uh, because previously I had some very very clever uh, code to implement same site cookies, but it turned out that these guys have actually added support for them directly. Uh, Okay, if I go to my to the configuration of my of my web application, I actually had to turn it off to show you the attack. I can now turn it turn it back on. Use the strict option. Uh, I'm gonna step my application. I'm gonna build it. And I'm going to run it. Okay, the application is running. I can go. I have my uh, bogus site. This hasn't changed. And I have my I have my legit site. I'm still logged in because the authentication, even though I restarted the, uh, the web application, doesn't matter because the authentication cookie is still, uh, is still in the browser. Uh, but if I go on and embark on winning an iPhone again and get back in here, ah, sorry, the demo didn't work. But the reason it didn't work is that I had an old authentication cookie here. Uh, and it didn't have the same site attribute, so I need to log in, log out, and log in again. Okay, so I have my profile information. I go and win an iPhone again. Okay, and the attack has been uh, has been thwarted. If I go into Chrome DevTools, just to show you really quickly. Um, how the request looks like. I'm going to win an iPhone. OK, shows up here. Here's my request. Um, and you can see that in the request header, uh, the authentication cookie is nowhere, nowhere to be found, right? So the browser, uh, the browser protected me. Um, if you are a heavy Chrome user, you can also go into the application tab. And here is the authentication cookie. And if you go scroll here, you have the same site same sort of attribute uh, here, and it says strict. So that's the that's the value we've set, and um, and we we now are protected uh, against uh, C surf attacks, right? Um, if that was so simple, then we wouldn't be uh, sitting here, because if I go to Firefox, for example, uh, do the same thing, and I may. Log in here. Okay, I have my my profile information. I try to win an iPhone from from Firefox. Same thing. Thank you. I go, and I was hacked again. Why that is? Uh, the secret here is, unfortunately, that. Um, uh, Firefox doesn't support same site cookies. So this is a protection that's purely deployed uh, client side, and if the client does not obey the protection, then uh, we're, we're out of luck. Um, okay, so uh, if there are any caveats with, um, with this approach, the main caveat is browser support. So Chrome supports it, uh, which is good. Chrome on mobile devices supports it, which is good. Um, a niche browser called Opera support, but none of the other major browsers uh, have a clue. Um, so Firefox has a plan to support it, but all the other browsers are uh, are not playing this uh, playing this game for now. So if we want our protections to be really bulletproof, we should try to protect ourselves on the server side. Um, and on the server side, what we really want to do is we want to detect a situation where a form is being submitted that comes 
not from the legit side, but from the bogus side, right? Um, and this is what the origin header tells us. So whatever your browser downloads a page, uh, and if that page contains a form, and if that form is submitted, uh, you, it, the browser attaches uh, the origin header, which contains the domain of the, uh, of the server that the form has been downloaded from. And this will allow us to distinguish whether the form is coming from a legit site or whether it comes from, uh, from the bogus site. Uh, which will uh, which will be very very useful. Um, one important information that some HTTP headers um, like Cookie and Origin are heavily protected by the web browser, and this is one of those security critical headers that that the browser actually protects, and you can't access it from, for example, for example, JavaScript. That's not the case with all HTTP headers, but this one is. Uh, is protected, which is which is great. Uh, also, this is a very very mature mechanism. It has been standardized. There's a, uh, there's a very readable RFC, and and uh, and browser browsers uh, do uh, do support it. So if we go to our crime scene again, uh, you can see that the arrow from the victims. Uh, victim's browser to the legit site is green. This means that the authentication, we don't have same site cookies here, so the, the request is still authenticated. It will, it will still contain the authentication cookie, but we are stopping it on server side, and the server can check that the origin of the form is not from the legit site, but from the, uh, but from the bogus site. Uh, and we can, we can see see how that works. So the first thing, thank you ASP.NET security team, I will turn off the same site cookies to just to revert to the previous uh, to the previous uh, protection mechanism. And most web frameworks these days, and especially ASP.NET that I'm using here, um, allows for uh, putting your own code to in the HTTP request processing pipeline. So what I have in here, what's um, in ASP.NET and also in other frameworks called uh, a middleware, which is just a piece of code that executes one of the steps of um, processing uh, of processing the HTTP requests. So what we do is we we have one form. We use post for it, so uh, we restrict our code only to uh, to posts. And here uh, the the bulk of the code is uh, is trying to extract the origin header from the HTTP request and get get the host. Um, in some circumstances, the origin um, the origin header can be missing, so we can fall back to a header uh, that's known as the referrer. The difference between the two is that the origin only contains the uh, the domain name, the port, and the, and the protocol, and the referrer contains the full URL where the form was downloaded from. So if, if for some reason origin is missing, um, then, then we can fall back to the referrer one. And when we, when we have this, we, we check if we have the origin. Um, if we don't have the origin at all, it might be a reasonable defense policy to deny the request just in case. Uh, but if we have an origin, we check if it's us. Uh, one other option would also be, you, you can also support sending forms from a set of uh, sites you trust, so you can check that the origin is in that set as well, and that would also be a reasonable, uh, a reasonable protection. Uh, and if we detect that something is off, uh, that is, origin is missing or the origin is not us, uh, basically, and then we set the status code to 401, uh, uh, which is unauthenticated, and we short circuit the request processing. So, if we decide that uh, we want to drop the request, then uh, we, we don't execute the rest of the HTTP processing pipeline. If everything is okay, then we just execute the all the next steps, and the processing continues um, continues normally. Uh, so, in ASP.NET, this is just a little bit of boilerplate. The only thing I have to uh, do is to register this thing. Use middleware. Pass it 
orange and check middleware. Okay. Okay, so right now I'm going to shut down my application. I'm going to build it. And I'm going to run it. Okay, I will log out again. I logged out for precisely the same reason as before. The authentication cookie that I had in here was had the same side attribute. So uh, if I use that cookie, the attack would still be thwarted, but by not but the, by by checking the origin uh, header. Uh, okay, so I log in again. Okay, there I go. I have my profile information and. Once again, I believe that someone's going to hand me a $1,000 or more iPhone X. Uh, okay, so as you, as you can see, uh, my data is, are, are still okay. Uh, if we go into Chrome DevTools and try to see how the response looks like, I try to win it again, and okay. Um, what I have in here see is a, uh, is a request and you can see that this request contains the authentication cookie that's a, that's a name that I send set for the ASP.NET Core C serve sample auth cookie is my authentication token so you can see that it still has been sent to um, to the server uh, but the re response that I got was 401 unauthorized so uh, so the server protected itself correctly, and you can see that the origin, uh, even though we submitted to uh, web.local, uh, the origin was uh, correctly reported by the browser as evil.local, uh, which, uh, which is our bogus site. Uh, so we have uh, what looks like a very, uh, very reasonable protection, right? Um, so, uh, if you've been listening diligently to, to me walking you through the code, you notice probably what the, what the caveat is. Has anyone noticed? So the caveat with this protection is that the origin header might be, might be missing. It might be stripped by um, some form of networking gear, um, reverse proxies, load balancers. Uh, whatever, uh, but also mm, the, the HTTP specification contains um, certain conditions under which it's actually desirable to strip the origin header out. And one of those situations that you might, you might run into, especially with single page applications, is that if you have uh, cross-origin Requ uh, resource sharing configured as you should if your uh, front end and your back end are on different domains. Uh, if there's a redirect in such a case, then the specification considers origin to be a privacy sensitive information and actually disallows applications uh, that conform to the HTTP spec to disclose it. Therefore, uh, it actually explicitly says remove the origin header. Um, and if we have the origin header removed, we cannot really rely on it to, to protect ourselves, except perhaps by uh, just dropping such requests, which, which is not always, not always desirable. Um, okay, so, so we've had two defenses so far, none of them, none of them perfect. Uh, so we, we've so far, we've been looking at where the, where the data come from in terms of uh, domains, addresses, uh, and, and so on. But what we, uh, another way to look at it is that we, we, as a legit site, want to make sure that we only trust the forms that we have previously shipped to the user. Um, and we can use tokens for that. Um, so the, the idea here is to embed a token in every, in every form. Um, and check that token back uh, when the user submits the form. If the form contains a token that we have previously issued, then we know it's, um, it's, it's a legit request. Um, sorry, the, the idea here is to take a perfectly random value and send it to the user via two channels. One of the channels is a cookie. 
uh, and the other channel is actually a hidden field in, in, in the form. And when the user submits, uh, submits the form, uh, we, we now have those two, two random values, and we can see that if they match, uh, if they match or not. If they match, then everything is okay, and we, um, and we, we can accept such a request. And, and if uh, if they don't match, then we, um, then we need to drop such a request. The problem here is that uh, for this solution to be bulletproof, we would need to remember every token we. We issue, and that is something um, something that is not manageable for uh, for even modest websites that have certain certain amount of traffic. So the trick that's usually employed in here is that um, the random value is not stored on the server side, but it's encrypted with a uh, with a key that's only stored on the server, um, and those encrypted values are again transmitted in in those two channels. Um, if the user submits the form, then they are decrypted and and checked. This allows us to not actually remember those those values, so uh, we get rid of the requirement to store some state on the server side, which is great. Um, the other good news is that a lot of web frameworks have that protection built in. So I myself, uh, I'm a .NET guy, so uh, I'm, I'm covered pretty well. But as far as I looked into, into other frameworks, um, such as some Rails frameworks and uh, Spring in the Java world, this, this also, um, also works, works quite fine. Uh, if we get back to our crime scene again, uh, we can see that just as with the origin and pretty much all server-side protections, the arrow is still green. So the authentication cookie is still transmitted. The, the request is still authenticated. Uh, and we have no, but the protection uh, comes from the fact that we have no token in the, in the request. The token that we, we will have every time is the cookie, right? Because the browser does it for us. But the form here in the on the bogus site has no way of knowing the secret token, so um, so the website can easily detect uh, detect that the token is missing. So so the the request is not legit. Um, yeah, let's see let's see how that works again. Okay, so I will remove this thing again, not to be fooled by my previous uh, previous attempts. So in order to enable this, I need to do three things. One of them is to configure the support on, on, for this in the framework itself. So services, add anti-forgery. In the very simple cases, that's it. Um, it's, it's all I need to do. If I'm more sophisticated, I can actually go and set certain parameters of the, both the form field and the cookie. So in the options here, I can say the cookie. Interestingly enough, I can uh, set the same side parameter for this cookie as well. Um, this is for demonstration purposes. If I didn't put the um, same site uh, parameter on this cookie again. Same site would protect the browser first, so it would protect me on the on the browser level first, and we wouldn't see the protection on the uh, on the server side. Uh, and other two interesting um, attributes are is the name of the cookie. I'll use name of my application, which is a good practice. Uh, C serve sample anti forgery cookie. And using the same mechanism, I can also send the form field name that will be automatically attached to, to my form, which we'll see in a second. If I omitted all of those, um, the framework would come up with some dummy names that are very unlikely to clash with your own names, which is like, for example, for ASP.NET, it's something like underscore, underscore, request verification token, uh, or something along these lines. OK, so it's ASP.NET Core. C surf sample anti forgery field name. The okay, so that's on the framework configuration side of things, that's all. But what we also need to do is to go into 
the actually handling code for uh, for the form, uh, which here it's it's a profile controller. And what I need to do here is to attach an attribute to say validate anti-forgery token. That tells the framework that this particular action, that this particular URL uh, that we um, that we submit our form to is actually protected by the anti-forgery um, infrastructure. So, um, so the framework will know to before it processes our request to actually uh, check the token. And one other thing that we uh, that we need to do is to go into the uh, the actual markup and um, kudos to ASP.NET Core security team again. This is something I again had to turn off previously. Um, this is on by default, so normally it should be should be fairly hard to miss. Okay, so I stop my application, I build it. And I run it. Okay, and close this. I log out again. I log in again. Okay, and I try to win an iPhone, and I may go straight into the DevTools. Okay, so now you can see that the request has failed again, and let's look at the how the bogus site constructed its uh, HTTP request. And we got HTTP 400 better request, which is a reasonable answer, by the way, for web framework. But when you go to the cookies, you can see that the request contained both the authentication cookie and it also contained the anti-forgery cookie. So the element that's missing here um, is definitely not the cookie, it's in the form. So if you go to form data here, you can see that there is, there is no token here. If we go and make a legit request here from our legit website and we update something here, and we, okay, this request went through. Um, and if you look at it, it contains the authentication cookie and the anti-forgery anti cookie, but oh, I can see no form data. So I'll, I'll show this in, in another place. If I go and look at how my form actually looks like in HTML, you will notice that it has a hidden input field with the field with the name that I have specified before, ASP.NET Core CSERF sample anti-forgery field name. It's type hidden and it contains some blob of data. And that blob of data is actually the encrypted, um, encrypted random value. And yet again, we're, um, we're protected. And for very good reasons, uh, most web frameworks fall back to, uh, to this method of, of actually uh, providing like an out-of-the-box uh, support. Are there any caveats with this? Uh, of course there are. Um, if you, um, like, I'm probably one of the biggest crypto geeks around, uh, but if there are caveats, the crypto is the, is the first of them. Um, if you crypto is complicated to manage, so you suddenly have to care about encryption keys, storing them, uh, managing them, restricting access, rotating all of this, all of the stuff that you you don't really want to do. Um, other thing is that encryption actually costs you money. Um, it costs you compute power. Uh, if you run in the cloud, in addition to actually encrypting and decrypting stuff, you're also paying for if you decide to store your keys in, in a dedicated service like you should, um, like stuff like um, Azure Key Vault or Google um, Key Management uh, Service and um, the KMS in, in the AWS cloud, you are paying money 
for each request and response to encrypt and decrypt stuff will actually incur cost for you. Um, uh, the, the other downside is that this thing is harder to pull off if you're not having a regular website but a, but a REST API. Uh, and the, the factor that makes it harder is um, that there's no form that you can attach the hidden field to. You have to explicitly transmit it either in the request bother in your JSON or XML uh, or whatever you're using uh, to transmit uh, data to and from your REST API. Um, but the, the good news is that um, web for the front-end framing, such as Angular, um, are also playing in this space. So it it's should be fairly easy to configure your web framework and your front-end framework to, uh, to collaborate. But this is one more thing that, that you have to do. Um, and the final caveat is that this uh, protection is totally invalidated if you have a cross-site cross script, cross scripting bug on your website. Uh, if you have that, um, the attacker can plant a piece of JavaScript uh, on your website that will retrieve the hidden form field and transmit it to them, therefore allowing uh, for, for planting the attack on the bogus site. So you have, if you have cross-site scripting, I'm sorry, but this will, will not work for you at all. So you might ask a question, how, uh, how serious the cross-site scripting uh, thing is uh, on the OWASP top 10? site that I mentioned, uh, it's ranked even higher. It's number three. It's actually one of the more uh, prevalent problems that we see in web, web applications today. Uh, so uh, if you have an XSS and it's, um, it's fairly easy to, to make a mistake and have this, uh, this vulnerability, you're also vulnerable to CSERF. Um, Okay, so if you were to take just three things away from this presentation, uh, the first thing is that if you do nothing, you're vulnerable. Uh, and, and this is not because you're sloppy coders or uh, you introduce bugs, but it's because how, how the web works. Um, luckily, frameworks may cover you. Um, if, if you use a framework that has decent protection, okay, use that. Um, but if not, you... Uh, you should probably implement the protections and the protections uh, that are reasonable and, and well-regarded I, I presented to you today. Um, so this application that I showed you, um, it's up on GitHub. So um, if you want to go and, and play with it, here's a, here's a link. Um, the, the thing behind the URL is fairly opaque, but the full repo name, I, th I think, would be even harder to remember. So uh, you want, if you want to play with it, just shoot it a picture and, um, and go over there. One word, there are two branches. One, the master branch is fully protected using all the means we, we discussed today. Uh, but there's also a branch called arms down, which is completely vulnerable and doesn't have any of those protections if you want to play hackers. Um, the next thing is, uh, don't, don't be a stranger. I'll be hanging around if you want to talk about this stuff. Um, just ping me, ping me in the hallways, and I'm always happy to, um, to talk software security. If you want to shoot me an email, it's my private address and my, my company address. Uh, follow me on Twitter, and all of my professional life is these days on GitHub. So if you want to take a look, just, um, just go there. Uh, one last thing, um, I, I work for a company called Particular Software, which this talk has nothing to do with, but I will be having another talk uh, more related to my day job tomorrow. So if you want to pop in, uh, I, I certainly recommend that. That's all from me. So uh, we have, uh, as far as I can see, some five more minutes. So uh, if you want to ask me anything, I'm, I'm here. You might also go to your laptop and fix your applications. Okay, if you have no further questions, then um, as I said, I'll be around. Um, and thank you, thank you for coming here. <laughs>